Good morning, everybody. My name is Rick, and I'm a pastor here at Living Water Community Church. I want to welcome you. Welcome those who are joining us online. Before I jump into my messages, can we just give it up for the Artesian Well Worship Team led by Amanda? You guys do a great job. Uh, last, last week they let me jump in there with them. It's harder than it looks. It's been a long time since I've been up here trying to lead worship. And it's, it's so uh, new appreciation for the team. And uh, we're grateful for what you guys do for us. I came across an article, a funny article, uh, entitled Christmas Gifts for Men. And I, I want to be an advocate for the men out there because I, I, I know sometimes that coming into Christmas, it's a, it's a little rough for us sometimes. Huh? And so, and so this guy says, buying gifts for men is not nearly as complicated as it is for women. Follow these rules and you should have no problems. Rule number one. I'm going to go through them quickly. Pay attention. When in doubt, buy him a cordless drill. It does not matter if he already has one. This person says, I have, I have a friend who owns 17. And he, and he has yet to complain. As a man, you can never have too many cordless drills. No one knows why. Rule number two, if you can't afford a cordless drill, buy him anything with the, with the word ratchet or socket in it. Men love saying those two words. Hey, George, can I borrow your ratchet? Okay, by the way, are you through with my uh, 3 8, 8 inch socket yet? Again, no one knows why. Rule number three, if you are really, really broke, buy him anything for his car. <laughs> 99 cent, we won't need this down here. Ice scraper, a small bottle of de ice, or something to hang from his rear view mirror. Men love gifts for their cars. No one knows why. Rule number four never buy men bathrobes. Once I was told that if God had wanted men to wear bathrobes, he, would have, he wouldn't have invented jockey shorts. <laughs> Rule number five you can buy men new remote controls to replace the ones they have worn out. If you have a lot of money, buy your man a big screen TV with a little picture in the corner. Watch him go wild as he flips and flips and flips. <laughs> Someone said amen to that one. Rule number six, do not buy any man industrial sized canisters of aftershave or deodorant. I'm told they do not stink, they are earthy. <laughs> no, they stink. Rule number seven, buy men label makers. <laughs> Buy men label makers, almost as good as cordless drills. Within a couple of weeks, there will be labels absolutely everywhere. Socks, shorts, cups, saucers, door, lock, sink. You get the idea. No one knows why. Absolutely true. Rule number eight, never buy a man anything that says <laughs> some assembly required. And the brother said, come on, man. on the box. It will ruin his special day, and he'll always have parts left over. <laughs> no one knows why. <laughs> this is so true. Rule number nine. Good places to shop for men include Northwest Ironworks, Paul Lumber, Home Depot, John Deere, Valley RV Center, Les Schwab Tire, Napa Auto Parts, and Sears Clearance Centers are also excellent men's stores. It doesn't matter if he doesn't know what it is. <laughs> Rule number 10. Men enjoy danger. That's why they never cook, but they will barbecue. No one knows why. <laughs> Get him a monster barbecue with a 100-pound propane tank. Tell him the gas line leaks. Oh, the thrill, the challenge. Who wants a hamburger? <laughs> Rule number 11. Tickets to a football game are a smart gift. However, he will not appreciate tickets to a retrospective of 19th century quilts. Everyone knows why. Rule number 12. Men love chainsaws. Never, ever buy a man you love a chainsaw. <laughs> if you don't know why, please refer to rule number seven and what happens when he gets a label maker. Everything's going to get cut. Rule 13. It's hard to beat a really good wheelbarrow of aluminum extension ladder. Let me try that again. It's hard to beat a really good wheelbarrow or an aluminum extension ladder. Never buy a real man a step ladder. It must be an extension ladder. No one knows why. That's funny because I, I just went to the store and I saw a ladder and I took a picture and I sent it to the family chat. I said, this is what I want. <laughs> Rule number 14, rope. Men love ropes. It takes us back to our cowboy origins or at least the Boy Scouts. Nothing says love like a 100-foot, three-foot, 
three inch manila rope and no one knows why. Well, now you guys got all the things that you can possibly get for the man that you love in your life. Speaking of which, we, we just started a series that, we've that we are excited to call The Perfect Christmas Gift. And when we talk about the perfect Christmas gift, it, no, it's not a power tool or ticket to a football game or, or even a rope. The perfect Christmas gift is based on what you saw in the intro. The prophet Isaiah, when he mentioned it, it he said in, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, also gives us the reason for the season, whose name is, come on somebody. He says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, who was this child? It says, for unto who was the child born? Come on, someone say us. Unto who was this son given? Someone say the son was given to me. Come on, somebody. It was given to me. And then he says, wrapped up in these four little, I call them prophetic titles, is, are what I call the perfect Christmas gift. Now, I don't care if you have the best Christmas ever in terms of the things that you receive this year, material things. Nothing you receive is going to compare to the gift that God gave us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so we touched on the first, the first prophetic name last week. It was the wonderful counselor. And how many know that no one could give better advice than God himself? Why is that true? Because God sees a perspective that we will never see. Amen? All we can see is what's in front of us, and then we can hope for what might be down the road. But God sees the, 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 the beginning from the end and everything in the middle. And so he's the most qualified to give the best advice to anybody who is listening. The question is, are we listening? Come on, somebody. The other thing is that I pointed out is that, that the good news is of the gospel is that yes, Jesus came as a babe, but he didn't stay a baby. Amen. He, 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 he grew up. He lived a sinless life. He died a cruel cross on, uh, uh, died a cruel death on the cross. But the Bible says three days later, he rose again. Amen. And the scripture says over 500 people saw him. And so the truth of the matter is, I know we don't act that way sometimes, but this is the truth. We serve a risen Savior Amen. who wants to walk with us and talk with us and guide us and lead us every day of our lives Amen. if we will learn to listen. It was not, not Jesus that said, my sheep know my voice, and they listen to me. Do we serve a risen Savior? Yes. Is he still alive today? Yes. He's still alive today, and he has the ability to communicate to those who are listening and paying attention. Now, Psalms 32, 7, he says, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and you will surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. God wants to lead us and to guide us. David said as much in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. You want to know why God's doing it? So he can get the glory in your life. Amen? Even though he says, I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen? Last week we said God knows where all the green pastures are. And he knows where all the still and quiet waters are located. Do you need peace in your life? We need to follow the good shepherd. He knows how to counsel and protect that which belongs to him. And we belong to him, my friends. Which brings us to this morning's title. And part of what I call the perfect Christmas gift. Because the Bible says not only is he the wonderful counselor, it also says he is the, help me out somebody, the mighty God. Say the mighty God. He is the mighty God. Now, now, now before I jump into the, the, him being the mighty God, can we first set the stage? I want to set the stage again. Now, now, now I said, in, in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah prophesied this, some 700 years before Jesus would even come on the scene, things were bad. 
They were extremely bad. Things had gone dark during the times of Isaiah. And Isaiah 1, 1, he kind of gives us a, a glimpse or a hint as to what was going on during those times. I want, to, I want you to see if you can pick up uh, uh, why, he, why things have gone bad. Isaiah 1, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that, Je that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, one king, Jotham II, Ahaz III, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, verse 2, hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. Anybody see the problem that God is having with his children of Israel? What's the problem? Anybody have kids? Yes. Anybody have kids who you've spent your time with, you, you've loved them, you've read them, you've spent your resources on them, and then when they grew up, ah, they rebel against you. Come on, somebody. Does anybody remember how that makes you feel? Well, the prophet Isaiah is expressing that same thing about the heart of God toward the children of Israel. I reared them. I brought them up. I protected them. And now they've turned their back on me. They have rebelled against me. And so because of their stubbornness and their rebellion, they brought themselves out from under the protective hand of the Lord. And I'll say they brought themselves out because God, my Bible says, God will never leave us or forsake us. Amen. But we walk away from God. We remove ourselves from his protection. And so they had, brought, they had brought themselves from out of his protective hand, and as a result, a great spiritual darkness had come over the land. But how many you know that God's love for them, his desire to care for them, had never changed? My Bible says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. And so concerning his heart toward his people, his love for them had never changed and, and his heart for them would be that they would never remain in darkness even from the very beginning when Adam and Eve blew it the, the, the first thing that God tried to do was to was to cover their cover their sins and to and to bring about a path where they could stay in relationship with him and so God wouldn't allow them to, to stay apart. So Isaiah, he saw a vision, even though he was in this situation, he saw a vision some 700 years that was going to happen in the future that God was going to send, even though things had gotten really dark, God was going to send a great light into the world as a solution to the world's plight and its problems. And there comes Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Well, how many of you know that that great light is Jesus? Amen? Amen. Then Jesus identified himself as the light. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Think about that for a moment. I am the light of the world. Not just the Jews, not just the, the people of his time. He says, I am the light of the world. And, and, and Isaiah would highlight God's mighty power and he would put it on full display concerning the coming of the coming Messiah. And number one, we see it with his birth because he saw it immediately. I want you to write this down. His power was on full display in four powerful ways. Number, first one is in his birth. Now, mind you, when I read this, I want you to take into account that he wrote this 700 years before Jesus was set up, would, would step foot on this earth. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Has anyone ever heard that story before? What's that the story of? It's the birth of Jesus, amen? It's the birth of of Christ. It's Mary and Joseph and the angel Gabriel and, and, and God overshadowing her and the virgin becoming pregnant with the, with the son of God. But I even love the fact that he gave him a name. And what was his name? His name would be called Emmanuel. Some would say Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. 
So represented in the gift that God has, even though the world was dark, no super dark, God saw forward through that and he said, listen, everything is not without hope. I'm sending forth a son and his name will be called Emmanuel. And in that name was wrapped up something for every single one of us. Emmanuel means God is with us. Come on, somebody. What are you facing today? What trials, what struggles, what challenges are, are, are you going through? If you're a believer in God, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not going through it by yourself, amen? God is with you. God is with you. Uh, uh, the apostle Paul said as much in Romans chapter eight, verse 31. He said, when then shall we say, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, help me somebody. Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us, help me, help me someone. Us all things. Us all things. And so I love that passage. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? And then he gives us the reason as to why this is true. If he did not spare his, his own son so that we can be in relationship with, with, with him, how much will he give us all things? Talking to someone just this week, going through a very difficult time. And because of that difficult time, the devil's whispering in their ear, this is happening, this is happening. God, God must have abandoned you. And then they start to attack your faith because the devil is always trying to attack your faith. How I many of you know this is true? And so the apostle Paul comes along, he says, are you, are you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs in so many words? He said, look, if God is for us, first of all, who can be against you? Who's having problems with your neighbors? Come on, who's having problems at your work, your, your boss, your husband, your wife, your kids? Who, who's having problems with, you know, municipalities? If God is for you, you got the favor of God on you. And then he went so far as so he, he doubled down. This is, how much, this is how much God is in your favor. He who did not spare his own son. But he gave him, he gave him up for, does it say it up there? It says us all. Does us all include you? Does, all, does all, us all include me? Come on, somebody. He says he gave him up for us all. Now, watch this. How will he not also along with Jesus graciously give you all things. Folks, don't, don't get through this season. I don't care what difficulty you're going through. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. The lie of the enemy that somehow God has turned his back on you. <laughs> it's almost impossible for him to do. Because he says, he says I, 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 I've given my own son for you. I, I, I did not even hold back. Do you think he loved his son? Oh, absolutely. But his love for you included the, the sacrificing of his son. We'll talk about that in just a moment. God is for us. So his power is on full display in his birth. But he didn't stop there. His power is on full display with his ministry. Write that down. Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. Listen again. 700 years. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from the darkness, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. When it says the, the, the year of the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's favor goes toward those who would put their trust in God through his son Jesus Christ and repent of their sins. Vengeance will go to those who reject him. You will get just what you deserve. But guess who also identified with those same prophetic verses in Isaiah chapter 61, Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee. It says in the, help me somebody, in the power of, of the spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him he went to nazareth where he had been brought up and on the sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet isaiah was handed to him the scroll of who 
the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And so he, he, the custom of the time, the, the, the scrolls would be rolled up. And so it was, he unrolled the scroll, it says, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, verse 18, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then, now watch this, he quietly rolled back up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Come on, somebody. Now, listen to me. Jesus pretty much quoted directly that prophetic verse that everybody in his hearing would have understood that that is a prophetic verse that's pointing to the coming Messiah. And in that one statement, he says, that Messiah is now in your midst. Now, maybe they didn't all understand what he meant. But hindsight now, we all know what he meant, amen? The Messiah has shown up. And when he says he came in the power of the Holy Spirit, what was Jesus doing, anybody? He, he, the, the moment he stepped out into his public uh, uh, testimony, in his public ministry, blind eyes started opening up. Come on. The cripple started walking, the deaf could start to hear. He healed those who had leprosy and, and various other, other ailments. He, 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 did, he didn't come to throw stones at people because the Bible says when he found a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, he was the one who spared her life. Even though Moses and the law says someone who's caught in adultery must be stoned to death, Jesus didn't give her what she deserved. She, he gave her what she needed. Come on. To the woman at the well who came there in the heat of the day because she, uh, uh, how many know you're not supposed to be going to get water in the heat of the day? But she had to. Why? Because when Jesus confronted her and, and, and the whole thing about who he was came, came out, he said, go and tell your husband. And she said, I, have, I, I don't have a husband. And he says, it's well that you said you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the man, you, the man you're with now ain't your husband. Come on, somebody. The reason, the, the, the women of the day were supposed to go get water before the sun came out. And she was there in the middle of the day. The women didn't want her around. How, how many know this is true? She, she, she was a lady, uh, she was a man stealer. Uh, uh, but Jesus didn't say that to judge her. He said that to point her to the living water. Come on. He, he, he said that to point her to who he was. And when she figured out who he was, the first thing she did was she dropped her ladle and she ran back and started telling everyone, I, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, how many know that God knows everything we ever did? Amen? Amen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He knows everything we ever did. I, I remember a few years ago, I, 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 I got a notice from uh, somebody, one of the parents. Some of our youth had gone to a party. And people were taking pictures, and they were taking pictures uh, of what was going on. And some of the kids were doing things that they probably should not have done. And, and, the, and the parent was hot because th these pictures got to her, and these were kids that were in our youth group. And then, and then they, they gave it to me and said, look, look at what the, look at the kids were doing. And so, and so that Sunday, when I brought it up in the message, I heard some of you guys had a, had a party the other night. And, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, oh, by the way, some of the pictures that you took came uh, to me, got to me, and then it got quiet in there. And so I'm just going to show some of these pictures. And then all of a sudden, everybody went, started slinking down into, <laughs> into the chair. They started, oh my goodness, because they were twerking and they were doing all sorts. I said, but I'm not going to show that picture. But, but if you're ashamed now, just because I mentioned it, you probably shouldn't have done it. Come on, somebody. But the good news is, <laughs> we've all done things we, we're, not, we're ashamed of. Amen. And in pointing out to her that the that the that you know the five husbands that you had and the man you're with is, is not your husband wasn't to condemn her. It was it was to point her to the one who could forgive all of our sins, the one who could who could forgive all those things. Jesus did not come to throw stones. 
He says, I have not come to condemn the world, but I've come to, to, to point them, to, to bring forgiveness to the world and, and bring the good message of who he is to the world. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. There was crooked Zacchaeus, remember him? Crooked Zacchaeus, who was the tax collector, found out that Jesus was coming and, and, and he was of short stature. And so the Bible says he climbs a tree in the hopes that he might be able to see Jesus as he's passing by. And Jesus starts to walk by and all of a sudden he stops and he looks up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, today I got to be go to, to be at your house. And the people who were around him were, were like, you know, why are you going to the house of this guy? He's a sinner. Tax collectors back in those days were known thieves. They got rich off of a, a profiting uh, because they were taking what the Romans wanted and then they would skim a little bit more off the top. They were known thieves. And here Jesus stops, calls them by names and says, I must go to your house. And in going to his house, the Bible says that he... he uh, he turned his life around and he, and he, became, he had a new lease on life. It's, uh, so, so God had changed Zacchaeus' life. Jesus had changed it just by showing up. Does God want to come to our house? Come on, somebody. Do you think God wants to go to your house? I promise you he does through his son Jesus. And when he does, things will start to change. Things will start to change. How about, how about the power that was demonstrated when, when, he, when he dealt with all those who were demon-possessed? I, I, I was reading about uh, in Luke chapter 13, the, the Bible says there was a woman who was, who was crippled 18 years. It said that there was an evil spirit on her, and she was bent over. And Jesus called her forward and, and, and laid hands on her, and she stood up, and she got healed. That demon had to leave. I, 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 I'm reminded of the person who had the demons who were, had a legion. There was over 2,000 that was in him. And Jesus comes along, he, and he was tormented day and night. He was living in a graveyard until the mighty power of God showed up through Jesus Christ and cast those demons out. And his life was changed forever and ever. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a miracle-working God. Is God still in the miracle-working business? Is he still in the miracle-working business? Yes, he is. I, I've seen it. I've seen lives restored. I've seen hearts healed. I've seen people who are tormented by demons completely set free. I've seen miraculous healings. When God shows up, miraculous provisions for what God can do and through it, God can do all things. Amen? I've seen it with my own eyes. My Bible says he's not a respecter of persons. What, he, what he's done for them, I believe that we have faith and we put our trust in him, he will do for us because he's the mighty God uh, and he's called Emmanuel, God with us. Should I go on? There's a woman. There was a woman that was caught in the very, no, caught, uh, the woman who had a, a, the issue of blood for 12 years, in that condition for 12 years, totally exhausted of finances and resources, and she found out Jesus was coming, and she didn't let anything stand in her way. She had to get to Jesus. The Bible says she reached out and touched him, and she was made whole. Amen. And what about the person who couldn't get there himself? The paralytic, right? Completely, completely from the neck down, couldn't it? His friends found a way. And when they came up to Jesus, because whenever Jesus was walking and talking, there was crowds that couldn't get there. They figured, they, you know what, I'm not going to let that deter me. And they went around, they climbed up on the roof, they cut a hole in the roof. And while Jesus is preaching, things, things are falling on his head. What's, what's, what's going on? What's going on? And they lowered him down. And in lowering him down before him, he looks at the man who's a paralytic and he says, he says, he says, uh, your sins are forgiven. And the people got upset. Who are you, the Pharisees? And not the people, people. I mean, the religious people got upset. Who are you to forgive sins? And Jesus, the Bible says, knowing their thoughts, says, yeah, I say to you, what's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or to take up your mat and go home? But just so you know that the Son of Man has the ability to forgive sins, young man, take up your mat and go home. And that crippled boy, that, that man who was crippled all that time, all of a sudden strength got in his body. He picked up his mat and in front of everybody went on home. Come on, somebody. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. He has the ability to forgive our sins. And he has the ability to, to, to put on full display the fact that he is the mighty God. Amen. He's mighty through his ministry, but he's also mighty through the invitation that he sends out to the world. Isaiah 55, again, 700 years before, this is what he says. Come all, 
Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. Oh, I love that. Now, didn't Jesus say something like that in John chapter 7, verse 37? On the, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is, help me someone, thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of what? I always like to say that's a great name for a church. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. Anybody thirsty in here today? Anybody hungry and thirsty for the things of God? Amen? So, so who is Jesus trying to reach? He, well, Isaiah told us, come all who are thirsty. Everyone gets thirsty. And then Jesus said the same thing. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. In Luke chapter 14, it talks about Jesus is telling a parable about the fact that God wants people in his kingdom. He sends out this invitation, but all, all the while they keep making excuses when the invitation goes out. Well, I just got married. Well, I just bought this field. Well, I just did it. And the Bible literally says there are excuses for not coming to the banquet that God has prepared. What's your excuses? What are the reasons that are keeping you from going all in with God? And so the Bible says, Jesus says, I, I sent out this invitation, but these did, they didn't come. And in Luke chapter 14, verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys and the towns and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. Why? So that my house will be full. How many know that there's plenty of room in God's house for all, for all his children? Uh, there's plenty of room. God's heart, my Bible says, is not that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. God, the blood of Jesus was enough to, to forgive the entire world. How many people are on the planet? Nine, nine, oh yeah, the eight, nine billion at this point. It's enough to, 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 to cleanse the entire world because Jesus said that's who he is, the light of the world. And God wants his house, his table full. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God's power is on full display in, in, in the fact that he's inviting everyone, anyone and everyone who will come and answer. He says, Whoever you, if you're thirsty, come to me. Everyone who's thirsty, come to me, and I will give you living water, waters that, uh, uh, that, that will flow from in, uh, inside of you and up to the Lord. I will give you that living water, the living waters of eternal life. Now with that, there's one fourth, there's a fourth one, a powerful one that we need to deal with that God showed his mighty power through. He showed his mighty power through his selfless sacrifice, which I believe is the greatest gift of all. And yes, Isaiah saw this too. 700 years before it happened, you tell me who he's talking about. We touched on this last week. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was placed on him and by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the apostle Paul saw in the book of Philippians, this is what he said about the one who's the mighty God. He said, Philippians 2 verse 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature, help me someone, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made a hum in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Folks, 
all signs point to Jesus as the mighty God. And when you think about it, God is even keeping time with the entire world around one person. What's, what's today's date? Help me, somebody. What's the year? 2019. 2019 from what? Help me, help me. From the life of one man. You know who that one man is? The entire world, whether you believe in him or you don't believe in him, whether you're a Christian, Jew, Muslim, uh, or, 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 or you don't have no faith at all, in China, Buddhist, Russia, India, the whole world is keeping time on just one man. Come. You think that's an accident? Or do you think God did that? To point people to who he is. Come on, somebody. It's built into our timepiece. Everybody's keeping time based on his life. That's whose birthday it is. Uh, and life that we're tracking. The whole world is on this one person. And so the question, the question then is what do we need to do to have his power resting in our lives? I'm going to give you the three things. You need faith, you need brokenness, and you need humility. And the faith is seen in Hebrews chapter 11. If I can get somebody up here on the piano. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Jesus said, when I come back on this earth, will I find faith? And all you need is the faith of a mustard seed. But you must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Any believers in here, amen? If you don't believe that God exists, this is what the Bible says. Creation itself cries out that there's a God. There's enough in creation to determine to start your walk, at least to start the journey. Because if you, like so many people, look at what, what has happened and you look at obvious design and you somehow conclude that it created itself, it says, the Bible says, the, the, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Don't be foolish. This building didn't create itself. Those chairs didn't create itself. The car you drove in didn't create itself. <laughs> the world did not create itself. Where there is a creation, there is a creator. You don't need, so you just need a little bit of faith. And then Psalms, 20, Psalms 51, 17, it says, the sacrifice you desire, the sacrifice that God desires is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. So the person who is proud and arrogant and rebellious, the Bible says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but I need God's grace. When I look back at my life, I know I've blown it. I know I've done things that I'm not proud of. I know that I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know that the wages of my sin is death. And if you, if you really want to know what God thinks about sin, just look what he allowed his son to go through. That was all about the sin of mankind. That's what God thinks about it. But he poured out his wrath on just one person so that you and I, if we place our faith and trust in him, would not have to go through that. To God be the glory. Come on, somebody. And then James 4, 8. And then James 4, 8, concerning humility, says, come close to God, draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. 
for your loyalty is divided. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. And so the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords emptied himself and he became a likeness of a man and a man who would suffer and he came to his people and those who knew him rejected him and here we got the religious people of the day and they're they're trying to instruct Jesus as to what God is like come on somebody does that make sense and they're telling them are you gonna heal on the Sabbath are you gonna do this on the Sabbath he says which one of you guys if your son falls into a pit or if your, uh, your, your cow falls in, are you not going to work on the Sabbath? Everybody works on the Sabbath. The Sabbath wasn't made for man, but man for the Sabbath. Understand this. He came to his own and they didn't even recognize him. And so God comes to us and <clears throat> he says, you need to understand the stakes he called himself the light of the world this this world is in great darkness but he said for God but I love you so much I don't want to leave you there so I'm sending forth my son and he's a light and in order for me to receive the light I've got to get to the place where I acknowledge that I need a savior nobody comes to the father unless they acknowledge they need him no one comes to Jesus unless they understand that they need a savior And the Bible says the person who says they are without sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. All have sinned. Have you always told the truth? Have you always honored your father and your mother? Have you always done the right thing? Who can say they've always done the right thing? And so the the writer is saying, understand for me to come to him I've got to humble myself I've got to acknowledge that that I'm a sinner and I need a savior don't jump and shout and get this and that the, the, the problem with the world is with, with the church is we, we are still too much friends with the world and so we come into our church experience and we're not we haven't let go of the worldly things and so and so we're not repented of the things that God sent his son to die for he did not send us to, he didn't send his son to die for our, for our sins so that we can continue to do those things. Continue to have affairs and to steal from our neighbors and continue to be lying and totally disrespectful to your, to your parents and, and to continue to do all that stuff. He, he didn't do it for that. He says, understand this is your situation. And this is what you deserve. The wages of sin is death. And so when I start to understand how good God was and is to me, that even though things were dark, he did not leave me in this darkened state. He saw down the line, he said, for unto us, for unto me, a child would be born. For unto me, a son would be given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and he shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace he's a gift not to be ignored but a gift to be embraced to understand what god has done to truly get to a place where you say oh my God, you have saved me. Forgive me for going my own way. All of us like sheep have gone astray and gone to our own wicked ways. And, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And if I would just get to the place where I would humble myself and present a brokenness and put my faith in him. He says, I'll draw near to God. And God will draw near to me. A broken and contrite heart, he will not turn away from. 
because he said he sees in you and he sees in me someone who loves him I mean I got a picture of of the woman with the alabaster jar and she took that jar and busted it and broke it and poured it on Jesus and they got upset with him this thing could have been sold for you know a year's wages why is it wasted and Jesus said listen the, and the money given to the poor he says the poor will always be with you but I won't always be with you and what this woman has done has been a service because she has anointed my body for burial and everywhere the gospel is preached she's going to be mentioned because in the same case, why are you letting this woman touch you? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And Jesus in another verse, he said, listen, whoever's forgiven much, loveth much. Whoever's forgiven little, loveth little. And the truth of the matter is we've all been forgiven much. And the result should be that we should love much. Amen? Amen? And so he's our mighty God and how mighty God wants relationship it was foretold and foreseen through the prophet Isaiah through the ages and it points to us today and if you don't personalize it if you just let it go off as some pretty little Christmas story you know and, and let Santa and the elves and the, the elf on the shelf drown out the most important the, 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 the best Christmas gift you have lost everything. God has called you to himself through his son, Jesus. Everyone is marking time by this one person. And at some point, it all comes to an end. Will you be ready? Will you be ready that if Jesus were to return today, you know you'd go with him? That's a serious question. Or are you too much a friend of the world that when that question comes up, you're not sure? The solution is to repent, cry, draw near to God, humble yourself, and in due season, he says, he will lift you up. And so while we're all here today, be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer of commitment and repentance to him if that's your heart if you've not yet done it and you would like to I'm going to ask you to bow the heads and to close your eyes while every head every eye is closed and every head bowed if that's you you want me to lead you in a prayer of commitment and recommitment to him just slip up your hand and say Pastor Rick that's me can you can you pray for me this morning? I'm not going to call you out. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see hands. I see hands going up all over the place. If you're listening online, God sees your hand. You say something like this. Father, I humble myself before you right now. I see your mighty power on full display through your son, Jesus in his birth, in his ministry, in his invitation and in his selfless sacrifice. I recognize that it was all done for unto us, unto me. It was done for me. I believe by faith that you are the Christ, the Messiah. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. There are many. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I humble myself before you today and I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for sending your son to die. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place and three days later rising from the dead. From this day forward, by your grace, and with your help, I surrender all to you and I choose to follow you. Fill me with your spirit, with your power, 
and with your love. In Jesus' name.